It's time for another episode of Sudbury Politics, the show featuring your hosts, Jeff McIntyre, Rachel Adrians, and Richard Eberhardt, bringing you analysis on the political news of the day from a Sudbury perspective. In today's show, the first in our very special three-part series focused on Laurentian University and its newest program, Insolvency Studies. We take course 100 with very special guest Alex Usher. Thanks for joining us for Sudbury Politics, the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Sudbury Politics, the show. Rachel here. I'm here with my co-host, Richard. Hey, Rachel. And- Hi, Richard. (laughs) And unfortunately for us and everyone else, Jeff, our other co-host, is unable to join us this evening. He unfortunately had a very sad incident with a popcorn kernel at about 3 p.m. this afternoon and had to have an emergency (laughs) visit to the dentist. So we'll cut him a break. Um, And as well, uh, a new face to the show this evening. So we're very happy to have Alex Usher um, here this evening. So thank you for joining us. Hi, Rachel. Hi. So I'll just give um, for everyone that's listening, I'm sure if they've been reading the newspaper, they've seen your name, but regardless, I'll give them a, a little bit of info there. So Alex Usher is the principal consultant with Higher Education Strategy Associates. Um, Like I said, he's been closely following the news and um, that's the news that pertains to Laurentian University. So Alex has a blog and recently he's broken down some of the more surprising or arcane aspects of the Laurentian story, which he's calling the Laurentian blues. So Alex's expertise stems from serving as a researcher and a lobbyist for the national and provincial education sector, as well as a national director for educational policy, research and program development and student associations. So thanks again, Alex, for joining us. We couldn't pass up an opportunity to pick your brain. Wow. (laughs) My first question for you is, How did we get here with Laurentian? Uh, I think we only know about two thirds of the story. And I think that's part of uh, why you're still having me on three weeks after the the news, right? Is that there's still a fair bit to understand. The simple answer is uh, this is an institution that kept making 97% of payroll for a number of years in a row. If I can put it that way. I mean, it was, it would, it would run deficits of 1%, 2%. And everyone would look at that 1%, 2% and think, eh, okay, it's not great, but it's not terrible either. You know, it's a two, you know, you lose $2 million on a $200 million budget, which is pretty close to what uh, Laurentian had, and then if you look at it year by year, you realize that's, that's not so bad. That's 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 a rounding error. <clears throat> Problem is, uh, you do that for you know eleven or twelve years out of fifteen, and you start to run up a pretty big def- an accumulated deficit, and so that's what we know about. That's the easy stuff, right? Now, why is it they twelve or you know why are they losing that amount of money? Well, they never got in the international student train the way some other institutions did, right? If they'd, you know, if they'd grown international students the way other institutions did, yeah, they would have had an extra $7 million a year and that's fine. They'd have been fine. Um, you know, the, did, did the collapse in local youth numbers. So, I mean, a lot, of, most of the province outside the GTA lost about 20% of their youth population between about 2012 and 2017, 18. Does that help? No, it doesn't help. Right? Um, they were pretty good about getting students from the GTA, about getting students from Ottawa, but you know, it didn't help. Um, provincial government comes along, cuts tuition. Eh, that's four or five million dollars the last just just the last couple of years, anyway. So yeah, that's a problem. Uh, COVID comes along, kicks everybody in the nuts. I mean, that's sort of another, you know, that's another fight. So it just it's every single one of these things, right? It's and you can't really sort of say, yeah, that's the reason. There's just a lot of little reasons why they never quite made it. And I think what must have happened at a certain point was people said, look, this is just bad luck. We can't keep having this kind of bad luck every year. Uh, So we'll go a little further into deficit next year. Well, you know, the 
And what were they was doing was they were they were going with cash management, right? So they got to a point, I think they must have known three, four, five years ago, you know, where in effect they realized because what they were doing was, you know, they'd start January, uh, a couple of million in the hole. So they're juggling bills and you know, any cash trap company does this kind of stuff, right? Then they go out and get these lines of credit. So they had a fairly big line of credit from um, Desjardins. And they would use that line of credit to go between January and you know when they get tuition and September when they get tuition. There was always like a period there where they would need, if you look at their annual statements, they've always taken out like 12, 13, 14 million in the line of credit. It's always there in April. It's not there in January. They pay it back in September, but it's there. This year, for whatever reason, the line of credit was not able to be used. And if you, I mean, so this is one of the big questions, right? Did, because the language in the affidavits is very curious, okay? It simply says, we went to Desjardins sometime in the spring to talk about COVID. At some point, we agreed we'd pay the money back in January and we would not use the, and the facility would not be available to us again. It doesn't say Desjardins cut them off. It stops just short of saying it, it implies that Desjardins cut them off. And that would be an easy way to read it, right? That, that Desjardins took a look, somehow they saw something in the books that KPMG, who audited the books for eight years, never saw. <laughs> and went, yeah, okay, we're not running any more money. Not only are we, are we not lending you anymore, you're going to pay us back and we're just, we're going to be at zero. Mm -hmm. The other way to read it, and this is the way I think that some people in the faculty association are reading it, is uh, actually the university wanted to take the bus over the cliff. That the only way they were going to get a resolution they would want in terms of salary and whatever and was to go into creditor protection and therefore they asked like i said the word the, the language is very curious it doesn't like i said it doesn't it just says we agreed that we would not draw on that fund again right which you can take as Desjardins saying please don't ask us to cut you off just repay it and then that's it or you could take it to mean they just said they weren't going to do it anymore um, we don't know. I mean, I think the first one is the likelier, but one of the thing that's, that is creating mistrust, and there's already a fair bit of distrust between the union and the institution that goes back several rounds of collective bargaining, um, is, is precisely that that language is not very precise. We don't know yeah. what happened between Desjardins. So this is the thing, uh, you know, they, the line of credit was the margin and they lost the margin. Well, then it turns out that it wasn't just the line of credit that was the margin. It turned out that um, they'd been mixing funds, right? That the, there's a whole bunch of restricted funds that they had been tapping. Now, I know there's been some very, I just been some very weird talk in Sudbury about this. It was not the endowment fund. It, like anything that you put into the endowment fund, that's safe. If your family, you know, somebody died and, Grandpa left a half million to Laurentian to scholarships. As far as anyone knows, that money's still there. Weirdly, the university is choosing not to communicate with those people and tell them whether or not it's lost or not. It's very strange. I've never seen anything like it. The, the comm strategy is about the most suicidal thing I've ever seen. Um, they're just not talking, even though it's, it's fairly clear from the documents what they were dipping into. And what they were dipping into was a little bit of some of the supplementary health plan little bit of the scholarship, which as far as I can tell, is the money that comes in for graduate students from the granting council, the scientific granting councils in Ottawa, right? So the uh, Institute for Health Research, uh, National, uh, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, Social Science and Humanities Research Council, what's called the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Uh, I mean, all told, there was about, I don't know the exact number now, it was about 14 to 15 million from Ottawa granting councils, which was supposed to be restricted right? You just, you just never take that money. They'd been taking that money to cover the bills. You can do that in the sense that the university only has one bank account. And apparently this is true of most universities. There is only one functioning bank account. Um, but most of them have what they call fund accounting, which says if you have 36 million in restricted funds, 
your bank account's never going to go below 36 million because those are restricted. Mm. Well, actually, turns out, and that's one of the first things that jumps out at you when you read the affidavit is, yeah, we just spent, we have 36 million in restricted funds and it's just not there anymore. Now the 36, this is where it gets difficult, right? I was saying all those annual deficits, they don't add up to 36. They add up to about 20. COVID might add another five. So where's the rest of that 10 or 11 million? So if they took that money, it must be because there's another hole somewhere. And you can't really tell what it is from the list of creditors and all the rest of it. It's just, it's not quite clear where that comes in. And that's the part I think that's, when I said we don't, we still don't know the full story, that that's part of it. We don't know where that extra 10 or 11, it's clearly been spent on something, but we don't really mm. know what. Um, and we don't really know, because I mean, obviously people are looking for someone to blame. You don't know how long this has been going on, right? And so who made the key decision not to, ex not to respect the division between uh, um, uh, restricted and unrestricted funds? It probably goes back several years, but there's no indication of when. Hmm. And the present, uh, the current president, Dr. Hache, claims he did not know about it until December. He and he's been the president for about uh, two and a half years. Year and a half, I think. Year and a half. So before that, there was an interim president, Pierre Zundel, who's now at the uh, Collège Communautaire de Nouveau Brunswick, and before that, it was Dominique Giroux. Uh, well, thanks for that, uh, Alex. I, I, we're back with uh, Alex Usher um, of uh, Higher Education Strategies and Associates. Um, and we're talking about Laurentian University. So Alex, um, somewhere along the line, somebody decided that um, creditor protection under the federal CCAA or creditor companies companies creditors arrangements act was the way to go. Um, and so that's the process that's being undertaken now. Um, do I get to right? We still don't really know how big of a hole Laurentian University is trying to plug, or do we know uh, how much they have to restructure right now? It's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer it. What we know is that you've got about $185 million plus in creditors. You gotta be careful about that though. So that some of those creditors are, it's like, you know, the, the, the people who are putting it forward the $45 million class action suit against uh, Laurentian for a data breach yep. three years ago. They're a creditor. Is that real money that you're, well, no, not really. No, they're not gonna lose that case. <laughs> so if they, if they do, it's not gonna be 45 million worth, right? Um, there's some kind of lien that, that one of their architects, the people who built the, uh, I'm blanking on the const uh, construction company's name now, but the guys who built the, uh, the architecture building downtown, uh, is like $13 million there. And who knows what that's about, right? I mean, that's, sure. that's a comp that's a company that's been embroiled in all kinds of lawsuits. So you have no idea if that's real or not. Something like 80, $90 million of that is secured against, uh, construction that's occurred over the last million, uh, over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, again, it's secured, like it's not really an issue. So how much do they really need to figure out? I mean, my argument would be that they probably need, it's a political question more than it is a financial one. They've just borrowed $25 million to get themselves from February to May. And of course the question is, okay, so what happens in May? Like you got to repay that 25 million, right? So what's going to happen? The likeliest course of action is that the government of Ontario will step in and they will say, here's $25 million or you know, whatever, some, some sum of money to cover that. And we're just gonna take it off your uh, grant for the next few years, right? Mm -hmm. So here's 25 million and next year when we're supposed to pay you 60 million or 70 million, whatever the grant is, uh, we're just gonna deduct five years and we'll do that for five years and then we're cool, right? It's gonna be something like that. Uh, won't so it won't cost the taxpayer anything, right? It's just it's a bridging loan, and so I think you got to say, okay, so if you have to think of if they're on average three to four million down a year, recent years, they're gonna have to cut that much. Plus, they're gonna have to cut you know another five million, whatever it's gonna cost to cut the institution. So you're probably looking at cutting the institution by ten million. So that's about five percent. That's a lot for a university in the sense that if you've got 70% of your 
funds tied up in compensation. And a lot of that is going to people who are who have tenure and for whom it is actually legally, it's quite difficult to get rid of those people without, I mean, it's not impossible through the collective bargaining agreement to get rid of them, but it does, you got to pay them at least a year's salary. Hmm. So it's not, a, it's not an easy measure for short-term cuts, you know what I mean? Um, and sometimes more than a year, like it's, it's pretty, it's, it's onerous. Um, that's what they have to do, right? I think the point of doing CCA is that they can do this without reference to the collective agreement because what they really wanna do is make the changes structurally. When you buy people out, often what you have to do is you have to say, well, we'll buy the young ones out first, right? The, the junior people, it's so seniority comes into play, it's all that kind of stuff. Uh, CCA, you don't have quite the same kinds of restrictions. And of course, the problem is what they really wanna do is cut programs. I would say, if you buy the conspiracy theory angle on, on, on this, that, that, that Laurentian deliberately pushed the bus over the cliff itself, um, the, the key moment was last fall when the university said, we really need to cut these 20 programs because we're losing money on all of them. And Senate and the, wouldn't let them. And right? Senate wouldn't let them. Yeah. At which point you're like, okay, so where can we cut? Like if, if, if we don't have enough self control as an institution to say, look, we love these programs. They're wonderful programs. We can't afford them anymore. What's your alternative, hmm. right? I mean, I, I, I mean, if, if you believe the conspiracy theory, that would be it where management says, actually, there's no way we can do this within the bounds of regular business. Let's crash the bus and start again, right? I mean, I think, I, and I, again, I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying, sure. There's a story there that's consistent with that. Well, and the alternative, I mean, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the alternative seems to be that they did what every other institution's done in this case, and they've gone to the province and said, "Listen, we're we're really struggling here, and we need you to come in and fix this and bridge yep. us our bridge the loans. Uh, we'll work over the next whatever ten years, five years to restructure our mm -hmm. our operations, and we'll come out of it. You know, with, with your monitoring directly, provincial monitoring. It's, right. Am I right in thinking that's how this is? always happened before this is the first time that this i don't think it's ha it happens that way in other provinces so it's certainly okay. happened a few times in nova scotia over the last couple of years happened to acadia more or less happened to cape breton in the early 90s uh i don't think it's ever gotten to this level in ontario before and it's clear that i mean it's clear from the affidavit that there was communication between the university and the province at least in the month of december definitely in january i'm forgetting now if it was even as far back as november but anyway just in in the sort of 60 to 90 days before uh things went bust there clearly was communication uh it's just secret annexes to the to the affidavit right there's it just says there is a secret affidavit and here's my letter to the minister and here's the letter of the minister back to me who knows what they said my guess was was probably uh go figure it out on your own Come back, come back when you're in a fiscal situation that you can make this work long term, and then we'll talk. But I think it was I. They wanted the institution to take a lot of pain before they put any public money in. They didn't want to let them off easy, and I think that's what'll happen as they come out. I mean, one of the conditions, I suspect, when they come out, will be they will ask the board to resign. They're not going to hand that money back over to the people who got them in that position. Now that's a weird, it'd be an odd one because the, I think technically the province only uh, names five out of 24 or five out of 25 members of the board of governors. Okay. Right. So, I mean, it'd be easy enough to get to pull those five because they're, they're, they're ordering council appointments, Lieutenant governor appointments. Um, but I, there's going to have to be something else. Right. Mm. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, you guys crash the bus. We're not, we're not giving you a new bus if you just crash the bus. <laughs> Give somebody else a bus. So you mentioned with the board and resigning. So I'm just curious in terms of who should ultimately wear this and whether or not the board should resign. Do you have a specific opinion on that? Well, the finance and audit committee should have known. Like, I mean, that's their job to know. The reason you have board of governors and the reason you have local boards, of, like there's, there's other ways to run universities, right? If I go to, I work in Eastern Europe sometimes, it's really simple. Government just comes in and tells you what to do. 
They don't, there's this notion that there are trusted groups of locals, right? Local businessmen, local community leaders who are there to oversee the institution. You don't have that in most of Europe, right? That just doesn't happen because the notion that it's a local enterprise just isn't there. You come to North America, every time we found a new city at 20,000, 30,000 people, we're like, oh, we need a university now, hmm. right? And, and in Sudbury, they decided they needed like four universities, right? Because you had the cat, you had Sudbury and Thornlow and Huntington and you know, whatever else. Like every, every, every group wanted their, I mean, no, I mean, Laurentian exists because, you know, the Protestants couldn't, were really annoyed that the Catholics got to start one first, right? Sudbury came before, before Laurentian. And a lot of it's like that in a lot of places, right? There's a lot of local jealousies and that's why you have these local boards. And we have local boards precisely because they're supposed to be so trusted in the community that the government doesn't need to micromanage your finances. Right. Well, clearly that didn't happen in this mm. case, right? And the fine, I mean, as near as I can tell, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about how you would have figured out, the, the key thing is, were you rating the, the restricted funds for the unrestricted funds? There would have been a simple way to get that, which is just simply, can you show me a bank statement? If the bank statement shows a number that is lower than the restricted funds, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Right? This would have been very failed, easy to figure out. KPMG never did it. The board never did it. <laughs> the finance and audit committee never did it. How did they, everybody miss this? Yeah, it sounds like the re like the, the revenue targets have been just been off and off and off, and then tuition cut, and then COVID. Yep. The Saudis all got pulled out. We've talked about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, there were sa lots of Saudi students up here, and, and I I know I I've seen them. Um, is there any? I mean, I I'm big on conspiracy theories. I enjoy them. Um, is is there any merit to my favorite conspiracy theory that um, it it was the provincial government? Uh, that wanted this CCA, a CCAA route uh, over the local board. Um, is there is there merit in thinking that um, pushing a public institution that's got itself into a structured uh, deficit and a large debt problem is better dealt with through the private court system than it is dealt with uh, by a, a government that's ambivalent at best with public uh, post-secondary education. Um, they might have acquiesced in it. I don't think there's any doubt that it's it's a local push to go that way. I mean, the if I'm re remembering the the sequence right, the board created a subcommittee, which was given extraordinary powers to do whatever, I, like, whatever it takes. Basically. It almost says that in the, in the document. It's the whatever it takes committee hmm. to get us out. They struck that committee in October. So I, it's been brewing inside the, the, the idea that, and, and you know, there's, there's other comments that, you know, that the president told, uh, not just the president, but the president's lawyer, the university's lawyer told the union's lawyer back in September that there was a good chance that the institution would be insolvent before the end of the current uh, collective bargaining period, which ends this year, right? So that there were, you know, within the next year, anyway. So, so this has been a clear track for the institution for a while that they were prepared to go that route. Um, I think they did make my, my, I think the evidence suggests that they did make one attempt to go to the universe, to the, to go to the province and say, we'd really like not to do this. Can you help us out? And the province said no, but I don't. So in that sense, the provincial government facilitated this route by declining to intervene. I don't think they were the ones behind it. So Alex, I have a question to get away from Richard's conspiracy theories for a mm -hmm. second. Um, so in light of this situation, can we look to, are there other universities or other public institutions who might be at risk in the future? Um, so I, so this is the line that people like Canada land, they had a story on Wag the Doug uh, came out earlier today. Hmm. There's a lot of people who want to talk about Laurentian as the canary in the coal mine. The, that, that's their, who's first, right? Yeah. I don't necessarily buy that. Uh, I mean, again, there's not many institutions that have that consistent record of missing over and over again. I took a look at, at a number of institutions and there were about seven or eight in the country that, that looked like 
them in the sense that they had a number of losses over the last few years. And then if you actually sort of look, add up those losses, you realize, well, there's really only a, yeah, there's a few others that kind of look like they might be in that situation, maybe. It's hard to tell just from the public financials, because I mean, if you look by the public financials, you wouldn't have thought Laurentian was a disaster. So, you know, um, the thing that's different about Ontario is that Ontario has moved to an American model of funding, right? Where the provincial government is giving about 30% of the operating grant and tuition fees are about twice that. Okay. And the rest of Canada looks more like Europe. Right. So I always say to people, we've got we've got an American funding system in Canada and we have a European system. They're just in different places. And and so nationally, if you take an average, we kind of look like we're between the US and Europe. But no, we actually have two very different systems, coigs. And Ontario is that way, and BC is like that to a certain extent. And what you're seeing is, is that there's been no increase anywhere in the country for the last 10 years in terms of uh, public funding after inflation. That's even more like kept, up, kept pace with inflation, but the number of students has grown. But what's happened is, is that institutions have said, okay, so we don't actually want to cut, right? And Laurentian's a bigger place than it was 10 years ago. They got more money for this and more money for that. And they pay their staff a lot more money than they did 10 years ago. Uh, how do you pay for it? And the answer is nationally, 100% of the new money that's gone into post-secondary for the last five years is international students. 100% of the money is coming from international because that's where they can set the fees on their own and they can bring in new numbers. And so it's been a huge cash cow for those institutions that have learned to play that game. University of Toronto posted earlier this week uh, or last week a $475 million surplus. 3.8 million in expenditure and 4.3 billion in revenue. Okay, they learned to play the game. Wow. Yeah, so their surplus is twice the size of Laurentian. <laughs> okay, that's, so again, if you look across the entire country, we've learned to do it okay. Problem is not every institution has learned to do it. Mm. Um, Laurentian seems to have kind of lost heart after that incident with the Saudis, right? The Saudis were particularly easy money. It was coming out of one big foundation and all that kind of stuff. But look, um, I've seen this line that Laurentian pedals and a lot of people in Southern Ontario who can't imagine small regional universities prospering. Uh, they like to pedal, which is, oh, we, we can't compete with those GTA institutions, right? So this is nonsense. Algoma is 20% international students. Windsor is 20% international students. You can make those numbers if you want to. Laurentian just never did. Uh, you know, out on the East Coast, at Cape Breton University, uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, it's now 55% international, or it was just before COVID, it had gone to 55% international students. You can... And they, they actually had a profit margin of like 25%, right? Like the revenues over expenditure, which is massive. You can, small towns can make money on this and do very well in this. They can expand it if they play well. Laurentian didn't. Um, one question we have left for you, Alex, and I, I want to bring it up uh, in deference to our co-host, Jeff, uh, who's a, a marketing guru. This is his, yeah. his thing, uh, and it's got to do with the comms. Uh, you mentioned that the comms is, uh, is insane, um, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm reading what the back fill of their communication strategy is op-ed saying we need to cut we need to let a little bit of blood out um there's all kinds of battling back and forth in the op-ed section uh, media is saying whatever it can get its little scrap of information and get its hands on which isn't very much and is running with that little scrap um is is their communication strategy as insane as it is is it working for them is it getting them where they want to no. go oh god no Okay. So look, here's your number one problem. They declared bankruptcy on the day that institutions started telling students across Ontario, started telling students if they were accepted or not. Wow. Ooh. Right? So this is an institution that needs as many students as it can get. And it's just told, and, and it goes radio silent. It says, we're going to cut things, including programs. And then goes radio silent. Nobody who's applied to Laurentian actually knows if the program they applied to is going to survive or not. 
That makes are me you, angry. Are, are you, uh, well, it makes a lot of the present students angry too, yeah. right? You're going to get, you're not only, you're not, are you going to get a lower, a smaller income in class next year, which is going to affect your income for the next four years because they stay in the system, right? That takes a while for that, for a bad year to go through the system. Not only are they going to have lower intakes for the next two or three years, because this kind of thing reputationally takes a while to shake off. Um, you know, they're going to lose some of their, their current students who are worried and they're, you know, I think they're, they're justifiably thinking uh, maybe a Laurentian degree isn't going to get me the, uh, the big job interviews I thought it would six months ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know how you could have entered this without some kind of comm strategy to talk to those people. I don't know how you could have a comm strategy that basically tells the alumni some of whose money you, you possibly have taken to go take a jump in the lake. Mm -hmm. um, That's you know, and it's not, if you really think the only war worth fighting is with the union over restructuring, like I, this is madness. Um, I know that that's, it's been a funny relationship between those two. And I know there's a lot of mistrust and, and, and bad blood, but Jesus, those are your employees. Those are the people who are going to run the place. If you, if you run those people down, if you, um, you know, you, you need a certain amount of trust in a community, in a, in a big corporation, which is effectively what the university is, in order to work. It, it, those are the people you're going to be left with to carry on your tasks once this is all done. And leaving them in the dark like this with an occasional sort of uh, accusatory finger. Mm. Deliberately choosing not to tell them the story of how this happened you know, of leaving so many questions, of deliberately, like if you read the affidavit, the story they're telling has got all sorts of holes in it. It doesn't mean that they are, uh, you know, evil holes or, you know, that they're, but they're just not telling a narrative that allows people to understand what happened. I don't see how you regain people's trust that way. So it's not just that I think it's, it's super counterproductive to students, super counterproductive with alumni, uh, I just don't see how the, the most basic relationship of all, of all that between the university and, and its key academic staff, I don't know how you repair that. And so whatever they think they're winning in the comms game, I think they're losing massively in, in a whole bunch of other contexts. And I, um, I mean, I, my initial thought when this happened was clearly the president was holding this so close that there was not time to put together all these communications plans. And I know that's true. I mean, I'm, from what I understand, most of the deans only had about 15 minutes notice before the creditor relationship went out. A um, lot, lot of very important people in, in and around the university did not know this was happening. So it's not, you know, the marketing department's fair, you know, the junior people in the marketing department who have to put those things together. They didn't put them things together. But we're three weeks on now. Come on. Like, <laughs> this is now not looking like a uh running like okay so we had to do something quickly and not everybody caught up it's now looking like a deliberate strategy to um i don't know uh, to weaken the university I, I don't see like i don't know what else to call it they've had three weeks to fix this and the fact that they haven't suggests that they don't care well, uh, I mean, Alex, this has been great. Uh, I, I really hope that, uh, I mean, we're, we're all watching this as community members here in Sudbury. And, and our hope is that, um, you know, the university will come out of this. It won't be intentionally weakened by anybody who's involved uh, in the process. So, um, I mean, that perspective is fantastic. Uh, we really appreciated uh, hearing from you tonight. Um, and uh, I, I I will say uh, thanks so much, Alex Usher, yeah. for, for joining us on Summary Politics, the show. Um, and uh, look forward to watching uh, for the next part of your blog, uh, Laurentian Blues Part 6, I think we're on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Look, Laurentian has been such a fantastic university to the Sudbury community for so many years. It deserves to survive and thrive in, for so many reasons. It is, it is such a sad story right now. Um, I, I'm really hoping I don't have to write too many more of those because they're, they're not fun to write. I believe it. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Take care, Richard. Take Bye, care. Rachel. Thanks. 
thanks so much for tuning in. Now, share your thoughts. Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Sudbury Politics. Let us know what you thought about the episode and share with your friends so they can share their thoughts too. We're so glad you joined us and we hope you tune in again for Sudbury Politics, the show.